Welcome to episode five of Next Gen Talks, an initiative of PwC Nigeria's Next Gen Club. My name is Asiri Abi, I'm the host, and I will be introducing very shortly our new guest on this episode. In this series, we will be looking at succession planning in family businesses. One of the findings from PwC's 2022 Next Gen Report indicates that half of the family businesses in Africa do not have a concrete succession plan in place. It is no wonder the involvement of Next Geners in their family businesses begin to decline as the business approaches the third and fourth generation. Most businesses in this part of the world struggle with succession planning and embracing governance structures that ensure the efficient functioning of the business. It's imperative that family businesses in this part of the world are well equipped with the knowledge and resources that aid in ensuring effective succession planning. It is also very useful to understand how existing traditions, conflict resolution, and articulating the big picture impact succession planning for family businesses. Joining me today on this episode of Next Gen Talks is Claire Sterzeka, a partner of private client Antax at Beauty Hatfield LLC, a trusted law firm in Mayfair, London, with over 300 years of advising world families, property owners, and businesses. Claire will be sharing her perspective on succession planning, traditional conflicts, and the big picture. And just before we get Claire on, we do have a nugget which we always try to introduce in our episodes. And sometimes we focus on myths and facts. Today's myth, succession planning is about retirement and I'm not ready to retire. So welcome Claire, and thank you for coming on Next Gen Talks. Hi Ziri, thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here today. Awesome, awesome. It's been a while we saw physically. I think the last time was maybe last year or was yeah. it this year? I think it was last year in London, but obviously, you know, you and I managed to do a few trips in Lagos before COVID, uh, which yeah. created some great memories. So <laughs> it's, it's lovely to be involved in this today. Yeah, welcome there. So what are your thoughts on the nugget? Succession planning <laughs> is about retirement and I'm not ready to retire. Yep, I've heard that quite a few times from people I work with, <laughs> but it's not exclusive to um, to my clients. You know, I think all of us um, focus on retirement and, you know, work work is such a big part of our life. You know, we identify so much with work. And I think when you start talking about succession planning um, with anyone really in a business, it's uh, it's something that some people really dread because they can't imagine a life without working. Um, and and that's often because it's tied up in a, a big part of what they see as their purpose in life. So when we talk about succession planning, you know, retirement is obviously part of that. But I think for me, it's really about thinking about the business and the needs of the business and how you can make sure that business keeps going in the event of um, something happening to one of the key leaders. So I try to kind of reframe some of these discussions around business continuity. You know, what, what needs to happen to make sure the business keeps on running? Um, and retirement is one factor that could impact business continuity, but it may not be the only factor. So maybe trying to reframe it in a more positive way. And I think also um, for some clients recognizing that, you know, OK, if retirement isn't something they want to uh, deal with anytime soon, then how about a change in roles? Mm-hmm. You know, if there's somebody who's really involved in the business, can they just start to step back into more of a, a non-executive role, for example, more of a chairman role? Um so yeah, it's just it's just trying to reframe the discussion, I think, in a positive way and recognizing how important work is to people's people's lives generally. Yeah, absolutely. And from what you've just shared, Claire, um, succession planning isn't a one-time event, definitely. It has to be planned for. So if you need to take a step back and then maybe become the chairman, hopefully that takes some time and a while. Um, so it would just be good to put that in perspective to, you know, to get your uh, thoughts and understanding stories behind some of the most successful businesses in the world, you know, how we connect with families and individuals at the center of those tales 
you know, we understand that that usually inspires you anyway. Um, what are the most intriguing lessons that you think have driven successful succession historically? Uh, and it can also be in your own field with clients that you work for. Yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, as you just summarized, then for me, what I love about what I do is learning about the stories behind these family businesses, particularly where they've, they've lasted for multiple generations. And I think, you know, when I've worked with family businesses who seem to get succession right, one of the key ingredients has been really celebrating the story of their business so that the family and future generations connect with it in a more emotional way and they feel more... Um, I guess, I guess more respect for the fact they want to try and keep that business going if that's the right thing to do. So often when I've been to family businesses, you know, where that's important, they'll, they'll really be proud of their story or have their story sometimes literally on the walls of the business as you walk mm. around. I remember one, I remember one family business I went to, they had um, pictures of all the staff on the wall who've played a part in growing the business, not just family, but non-family really connecting with their tales and the role they've played in that business, as well as the tale of the business itself, where it started from and where it is now, and also where hopefully it will go. And I think that emotional connection within a family is so critical because, you know, running a business and passing a business on comes with a lot of responsibility and burden. And you need to feel that you really, you, you really connect to that, that it's really important to you as a family and you really want to give your efforts into making sure that lasts for your lifetime. So I think having that emotional connection for me is key. And that's why I try to encourage people to focus on the stories yeah. i think also you know a kind of another insight around that would be really respecting how um how a business you know whilst it's really important to a family it isn't everything they've got a life outside of that as well and you have to just kind of reflect you know although the business is a great source of wealth and and potential pride and happiness for a family it can also bring about challenges and arguments and so on and People may not necessarily want to be involved in the business, even if they even, even if they love the, the tale of the business. And I think it's important to recognise that too. Mm. And, and I like that concept of storytelling as well. I mean, growing up as a child, I just remember how my dad would tell us stories every time we came home with our results. It was a time to celebrate, but then there was also a time to tell stories, and then we would tell those stories into the night. And it just kind of formed that very unique bonding, you know, with my dad. Yeah. So even though my dad is past now, when I think back, I'm just thinking more about those stories. And it's a huge connection it brings. So when you talked about the wall of fame as well, you know, I just started to think of a coffee table book of sorts <laughs> where yeah. we could tell the story of how yeah. we've journeyed through businesses. Um, is that something you also see? Or? Yeah, you do. And actually families will commission uh, writers and publishers to kind of help them create that mm. book. Um, I think also, though, you've hit on it there. There's nothing more valuable than just hearing a story from somebody directly from their mouth, mm. that oral tradition of storytelling. And I think where families get this right often is, um, you know, going on family retreats, um, having sort of family away days where they'll get the older generations to tell the story mm. in their own words. And that can be incredibly powerful. And I think the book is really nice. It's a nice reflection. And certainly for advisors, when we come into the offices, we're sitting mm. in, the, in the waiting lobby, you know, we can look at a book and start to get a feel for that business. That's really helpful for us. But I think for the family, also just hearing it directly from people in that, in that family is, is so much more powerful, actually. Yeah, yeah. And Africa has a history with telling stories. We, yep. This is how we hand our history down. Mm. And we're very good storytellers. Um, you can ask Nollywood as well. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. uh, maybe what I'd also like to just get our listeners to understand is what traditional practices have made family businesses struggle in the succession plan. Or what challenges have you seen in practice that make succession planning difficult? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think generally it's a lack, it's definitely a lack of preparation. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, I think going back to that nugget you said earlier, there's something in there about people being slightly in denial or mm -hmm. feeling it's just, it's just a really hard thing to address and they don't know where to begin. And I think that often means there's no preparation, no thought suddenly family, something happens, a key person passes mm -hmm. away and the family are left trying to work out what do we do? How do we run this business? Do we keep it going? 
you know, how do things how do things work in practice here? What what are we meant to, what are we meant to do? And I think that's where it gets gets really challenging. Um, tying into that as a theme is, you know, where where people haven't really prepared, that often means they won't have the right structures in place to facilitate that transfer. Mm-hmm. So it's not uncommon, I'd say, particularly with a business where the founder's still alive. So let's say it's first generation. So you've got one or two founders, maybe a sole owner or a sibling partnership type model, and they run things their way. They know how to do things. It's relatively informal around how they run things from a governance perspective. They won't have a board of directors necessarily, or if they do, they don't necessarily have formal board meetings. They don't have much governance in that business, either at board level Mm. or a shareholder level. And I think um, that can create some problems in terms of how, how well succession will work. Um, so I think, you know, for me, it's lack of preparation, um, governance being key to that. And I think also, um, lack of communication too. Uh, So almost like this is a really difficult issue for me to address. I don't know where to begin. So I'm just not going to talk about it. uh, (laughs) Just going to ignore it. (laughs) Like when you don't want to go to the doctors to deal with a problem, you know, you think, oh, not rather, I'll go next week. And then it's a week after. Same with succession. People think, oh, you know, I know I need to deal with it, but I don't know how. And they don't know how to begin talking about it. So they just don't. So that's mm, yeah. So you, you, would you reckon that it takes some sort of awareness, you know, getting up to that point, even for the founders, as much as you know the beneficiaries of the wealth? Yeah, and I think you know certainly since I've been in this business about twenty years now, um, there's been a huge growth in materials available to family businesses around why succession is so important to get right and how to get mm. it right. I mean, there's so much out there. Um, it's that, that in, in itself can almost be overwhelming because there's so much material and, uh, and connections out there. But I think just being curious about this and starting to learn and, and educate yourselves. And I think starting to have some quite natural conversations in a family around this, yeah. you know, whether it's over the dinner table or wherever it may be, you know, where are we going with this? You know, are the kids going to be involved? Do, we want, do they want to be involved? Do we want them to be involved? Do we want the business to carry on? You know, they may feel big questions, but I think starting to have some sort of quite natural discussions in a family about this and learning about what others do is really, really helpful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And thanks, Claire. Um, And and just trying to bring this into different um, worlds. So we've got the family, we've got the business, and these are all subsets of the family business. In Nigeria, for instance, there's a natural flair to have the male firstborn take on leadership roles. And that leadership may be the family just as much as the business as well. But perhaps that's not really what the business needs. It's just there's that feeling of, oh, I need to step up to be the one who takes over after dad or mom passes. And it puts a lot of pressure on next gen just as much as it raises anxiety for the founders, the pre-tracks or the mid-tracks. So I guess my question is, is there a need to be more aware as well of building a distinction between who could take over, who could be the successor on the family side of things, this thing from the business side of things, and there shouldn't just be a natural assumption that, the firstborn male heir is the one who should take the business to the next level. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I know culturally in 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 you know in West Africa and other and other parts of the world that is that's really important discussion to have. And certainly in the UK, that's been the case too. You know, we've had um, almost a natural assumption: my my next in line, my son, or primarily, or my daughter, will take over the business. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. You know, is that the right thing? You know, is that what they want for starters? Are they are they really wanting to do that? Because that comes with a lot of responsibility, um, and it may not be something that they're 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 suited to. You know, they may have skills in other areas. And I think often with families, it's trying to make that distinction between being an owner of a business and running a business. It's owner and manager, as people characterize it, and really assessing what skills do we need in the business. To what extent can those skills be provided for from the family group? You know, have we got people in this family group who really have got those leadership skills and commercial skills to step into these roles? And um, if they haven't, you know, are they going to be owners of that business? And what and what do they need to be good owners of that business as well? You know, they'll still need skills to kind of step into that role too, but they're slightly different skills. So 
I think assess, assessing what the business needs is really important. Um, from a family perspective, families will often feel um, a real sense of, um, I guess what's best to describe it, you know, it's a family business. They feel it's really important. They have family in that business running it. Yeah. Because, you know, how, how else will the business continue to, su- to succeed? And I think it's important to really analyze that and, and assess is that definitely the right um, thing to be thinking here? Because if you haven't got people in the family who can naturally step in, then maybe that's that's something you need to critically think about and assess. Well, do we bring in professional people instead? Uh, sorry, not professional, but commercial external people yeah. instead? Yeah. And, um, you know, have us as owners only. And that's a difficult model to kind of think through. But I think that does need to be that discussion. Because I think often where things start to fall apart, so family members are being put into leadership roles that they're not suited for. And mm. it causes people in the business to leave because they don't have faith in that, their leadership skills. And it can ultimately cause for you know, the business to fail if it's, not, if it's not handled in the right way. So I do think it needs some really careful thinking. And I think often for that next gen, if they do really want to do it, which is great, they, they're going to need a lot of support, uh, both internally and externally. So mm-hmm. we often find that next gen leaders will probably spend a lot more time, even in comparison to a non-family business leader, really and tra- going through a lot of training and external experiences and education to get themselves ready for that role. So they feel they probably have to credentialize, credentialize themselves even more than some of their uh, contemporaries um, to really prove that they've got what it takes to step into that role in the business. So they will often under, undergo a lot more training and educational experiences than maybe others would. Mm-hmm. But that's important as part of their journey. So, yeah, it's not an yeah. easy position to be in. But it, I think there's, um, if they're up for it and they've got the skills, they can definitely achieve it. But they just need, need the support in place. Mm-hmm. And I like how you say if you're up for it, because it's very possible also not to be up for it. And then you have to consider external parties as well. And founders also need to prep their minds for bringing in external parties. Succession doesn't necessarily mean it has to go to family. Um, I don't know if there are any examples that come to mind, maybe of third parties that have taken on the reins in managing family businesses. And maybe the family then comes in later. You know, it's a model that works, doesn't yeah, work. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, mm-hmm. we've seen lots, you know, particularly in the UK where you'll have an executive team that may consist of just non-family members. You know, you've got no family kind of acting in that executive capacity. And by that, I mean like a CEO, a COO, a CFO. They're, they're all external. They're yeah. all non-family members who may undertake this role. Mm. Um, but then you'll have the families members maybe acting as directors. So this is where the governance becomes important. You know, you've got your board of directors, which could be family, non-family. Then you have your executive team who really are responsible for the day-to-day operation, and that could all be non-family. Mm. And I think when you start to evolve your governance systems for family, it can then become much easier to think through, well, where can I sit? Because I don't think I'm going to be a great CEO, mm-hmm. even if mum and dad think I might be, yeah. but I think I could be a good director. And that means yeah. I'm still involved in the company and I'm still at the top overseeing things, but I've got somebody else doing the role that I'm probably not suited for. Mm-hmm. So I think it can it can work really well. Um, people just get worried that they're losing control and they're putting too much faith in people that aren't from the family. But mm-hmm. I think, you know, if, they're, if they've got the skills, the training, the aptitude and the enthusiasm to do it, and you've still got some fat, you've got the family oversight there, then it can definitely work. We see that work in countless examples both in the UK and elsewhere across the world. Perfect. And, you know, Claire, where we started, there were two key things you talked about, preparedness and communication. So let's just look a bit at communication, you know, how best to communicate that big picture um, and articulate to your family that this is what that succession plan looks like, or even the business. You know, is there a document or a greed that we need to build out maybe over a 10-year period to see this is how it's going to be? And then at this year five, for instance, I take a step back as CEO and then I'm chairman, and this is how it would affect remuneration or the benefits I get from the business. And at this point, this is where the next trend comes in, for instance. So just kind of lay out practically what communication looks like when it comes to succession plan. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think the starting point really is um, thinking through your vision for that business over the long term. So do you see this as a business that will pass into the hands of the next generation? And if so, why? Why, why do you think that's going to happen? Do you think it's such an important business that it's got the ability to sustain itself for, for a long period of time 
that it can easily be transferred to the next generation with the right governance framework in place. So I think the starting point is what's this what's this vision for this business? Is this a, is this a long, long term business that with the right governance in place can succeed and be passed down into the next the hands of the next generation? I think the, the second part of that then is communicating that vision and being really clear to the family. Look, I think this is a great business and I really want it to keep going and I really want you guys to be involved in taking this over. Uh, and if everyone feels like that's something they want to be part of, the next question is how? How do we actually do that? And I think uh, that then starts turning on the detail really of, okay, so if we're to pass this down, what does that mean for us as a family? Um, you know, are we going to just, the conversation we're having a minute ago is, are we just going to be owners? Or are we going to be also working in the business? If so, what what support and training do we need to take on those roles? What does our governance structure look like as a whole that, to enable us as a family to kind of own and manage this business successfully? And so for many families, once they start this process, they'll often bring in external people to help them and give them advice on what they think their vision is and how they feel they want to get there and stress testing that with others who see other family businesses and can advise on what are the key aspects they need to consider in more detail. And ordinarily, I would say most families will go through the process of starting to create a form of family constitution, which just sets out the key kind of um, goals of the family around, one, we want to keep this business going, we want to pass it down, and to enable us to do this, these are sort of the aspects we'll have to have in place to make that work. So they'll have sections dealing with, um, you know, uh, roles in people, um, mm -hmm. what corporate governance is needed, you know, from a family perspective, who should be involved, who shouldn't be involved, um, what their values are as a family when it comes to making decisions and running the business and so on. It will encompass a range of areas, but really it's a terms of reference document that sets out to that family. Yes, we want to keep this business going and here's the rules by which we'll, put, we'll play by to ensure that it, that happens successfully. So ordinarily you would have some form of family constitution, but then that has to be brought into practice and they have to kind of you know, make sure that what they're saying is actually happening. Um, so how are they actually going to kind of get around the business and, and make sure that they, um, they're meeting regularly, they're discussing mm. things openly as a family, they're getting the right training and support, they're bringing in external people to help them and so on. So actually, there's, at one level, it's the thinking and the documenting, and then you know, the next stage is actually then the doing. And that that all takes time. I'd, I'd say when you're really thinking about succession quite critically, it, uh, it, it does take time. And actually, it, it often means bringing about some changes, some cultural changes as to how you do things. And that's mm. not going to happen quickly. But I think for most families got a real focus on this um they will they will stick with it and they'll just make sure they've got some good people by their side external people who will support them with that over the long term but essentially i think that's the sort of the governance journey that most families start to go on when they're looking at this mm. yeah and thank you so much claire just as we close final question i know you guys just launched bill atfil just launched um i think this is lessons in legacy yeah that's right yeah, maybe if you could talk a bit about that and maybe some key recommendations that we could take away from that publication. Yeah, no, thank you. We did. So um, as you mentioned, uh, Boodle Hatfield's been advising families for 300 years this year. So to celebrate mm -hmm. our 300 year anniversary, we, we really wanted to kind of reflect on what does legacy mean to our clients? You know, we've thought a lot about our legacy as a firm um, and actually what does it mean to our clients? And we ran a survey with a number of our clients and contacts and, and what's been coming out of that is, um, you know, a lot, a lot of families are really questioning, actually, should we just pass on all the wealth down to the next generation? You know, our families have been very successful and, and have accumulated a lot, of, a lot of wealth in addition to the business. They are really critically thinking about, do we need to pass all of this down and keep on preserving, preserving, preserving? Uh, I think a lot of families, particularly in the UK, um, are looking at some of the issues in society particularly around uh, wealth inequality, climate change, and thinking, actually, how can we make a difference here? Because, you know, we've got a, we've created a great legacy in terms of the business we've built and the wealth we've built, but actually, how can we make sure we're putting that to good use? So we're finding there's a real growth and in interest in philanthropy. You know, a lot of families now are thinking around uh, how do we start to give more of our wealth away? Um, there's greater interest in sustainable investments. So again, people thinking, OK, well, there's a lot of problems in the world right now. So which are the companies out there that are trying to make a real difference and solve some of these problems? And can I put money into in towards those projects alongside my philanthropy? But interestingly, we're also finding that some, you know, some wealth holders are really questioning, actually, um, you know, do I really want to have all this wealth? You know, I, I can do my philanthropy and my sustainable investment. So actually, should I be a bit more ambitious about how much I want to give away? What do I really need? 
to keep me happy to keep me happy and in a good quality of life and actually what don't I need so there's some some really um, quite forward thinking disruptive discussions out there around um, what it means to be wealthy and the role that wealthy play in society uh, whether they give more away whether they pay more they, they look to pay the most they can in taxes you know all some you know some quite interesting things happening in terms of discussions around what it means to be wealthy and so I think for a, from, a, from a legacy perspective, uh, our clients are recognising that you know that there's a lot they can achieve. <laughs> Sorry, the dog <doorbell> just rang. <laughs> <laughs> I have not to cut that. All good. And my dog's barking. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, so I just say that last minute again, and then you can cut it back in. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, just oh, sorry. It's the danger of working from home because of the snow. Okay, uh, I think she stopped. Um, so yeah, so I was just saying, so I think so in terms of legacy, they're really, um, you know, they're really thinking through a bit more critically about how that le legacy can make a difference to the world and the problems we're experiencing. Yeah, and I figure that is a conversation that also needs to be had in terms of outlining the vision and also defining what the succession plan might look like. Right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, I think that's really, because if you're looking to do more in terms of philanthropy, um, sustainable investments, thinking about, you know, your tax position and how you want to contribute more to society through taxes that's starting to impact your des the design of your structures that will enable all of that to happen, particularly after your lifetime. So, yeah, it's, 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 it's really it's a really fascinating time to be in our industry right now. There's some, there's some, there's some very um, disruptive challenges coming our way, which I'm enjoying tackling. Absolutely. Absolutely. And on that note, what I can confidently say is we have debunked the myth Succession planning is not about retirement um, and you don't have to wait till you're ready to retire before you do it because there's a whole lot of discussion that needs to go into that. I mean, we've talked about sustainability just now, we've talked about tax, we've talked about the roles, the people, we've talked about natural heirs or not, whether in the family or the business. So a lot to think of um, and it's not something that will go away in a day. Um, but on that note, Claire, I wish we could stay on longer. <laughs> it was so much fun catching up again and having this enlightening discussion. Um, thank you, Claire. Um, and to our listeners, thank you for listening to this episode of Next Gen Talks. Thanks so much, Azaria. It's been great.